Hey everybody, welcome to Nassau Church's youth group service. We're glad that you are joining us once again on this beautiful Sunday in February and I hope that you are all doing very well today. So in opening our service, why don't we pray and we will begin our worship of the Lord God. Lord, we thank you for this Sunday, Lord, that we can come before you as your people to worship you and to the, do the work that you have called us to do, Lord. It's so easy for us to forget about the importance of the gospel, the meaning of the gospel, the impact it's supposed to have in our life, Lord. And let us remember it anew today so that we can find a joy and a passion for worshiping the Lord and also to live missionally, to draw unbelievers to saving faith in Jesus Christ, Lord. That is what you have called us to be. So, Father... We pray that this moment, please forgive us of our sin, Lord, because we know that we continually fall into that which we don't want to, Lord. It comes so naturally to us. But you tell us to fight as if we were in battle. To have victory over sin, which is possible if we were depend upon your Holy Spirit. And if we have your word, we have what we need to overcome sin. So Lord, as we come before you now, accept our worship as pleasing in your sight. And all this we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, if any of you guys are just joining us right now, once again, welcome to Nassung Church's Youth Group Sunday service. I'm always so glad to see you and to also be with you guys on Friday night as well. And if you guys, once again, please keep up with your Santa books. Right here for the month of February, we are going to be praying for Russia. That is our theme for this month. And we're going to go through the book of Matthew. So hope you guys are enjoying Matthew because Matthew is my favorite gospel in the New Testament. And as we are closing out February, you should be getting one of the these, a new one, uh, maybe sometime next week. So watch out for that, keep up with that guys. And of course, continue to be uh, on time for Friday night studies, seven o'clock directly as we will, uh, you know, of course come together. And I always wanna see you guys, you know, on time. So let us continue to keep up the good work in that. So with that being said, now we are going to go into our message for today. Today there's no surprises. We're gonna be continuing in our study of Romans. So we're gonna be on Romans chapter seven, verses 14 to 25. So we're gonna finish out this chapter today by looking at these 12 verses. So if you guys uh, have your Bibles open up to chapter seven, and I hope you guys are enjoying Romans because Romans is a great book that really reminds us about what the gospel is and why we should be excited about it. And we should have a knowledge of the gospel because we should have assurance of our faith, but also to be able to know how to explain it to others since we have to be able to explain what our faith is all about, right? So let's pray and let's ask for the Lord's blessing to teach us what his great word says. Lord, we pray that you will allow your spirit to work in us at this moment because we're so weak, we are so not understanding we need your help and guidance so much lord we are so full of sin lord that we need your grace up till this moment and we are so thankful that it is by your grace that we have any sense of assurance that we will make it to the finish line because heaven is probably still far off for most of us but until that time it's gonna be a journey. That's why you tell us to take sin seriously, to not live for sin, but rather to use the rest of our life to live for Christ. If we are Christian, then that is what we have been called to. So teach us right now what our Christian life is gonna be like today in the book of Romans. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So guys, if you guys remember from last week, we were looking at the first half of Romans 7, and it's pretty much the same discussion about freedom, bondage, bondage freedom, how once we were enslaved to sin, and it would have taken us to hell if we didn't do anything about it. But now, Jesus Christ has broken the bonds of sin from us, so we are no longer enslaved to sin, but now we are free in Christ. So, call, so basically, Jesus has called us to be Slaves of righteousness. If we are Christian, then we have signed up to be slaves of righteousness, not slaves of unrighteousness. So please don't, um, don't mistake your identity of what you're supposed to be as a believer. So now in this chapter, we're gonna be looking at today for the rest of chapter seven. This is a very interesting section because here now, you know, Paul has been talking about how we have so much freedom in Christ. We're going to be, you know, like growing as a Christian. We're a new creation and we're going to have so much victory over sin because we're such a new creation. But then Paul tells us this, that even as a Christian, even when Paul, one of the greatest, most mature Christians in history, he has a sin struggle. And this is what we're going to see in chapter 7, verses 14 to 25, is that it tells us even though we've been saved from sin, we're no longer under the power of sin, we are still going to struggle with sin. So just because we've been released from the power of sin doesn't mean that we're going to be sinless or perfect for the rest of our lives on this earth. So Paul is telling this, this to us in order to humble us in some way so that we don't become self-righteous and 
prideful and to think that we can become perfect so that we can look down upon other people who don't match up to our standard. He's telling us that every Christian is still going to struggle with sin until the day he goes to be with the Lord God. So in one sense, of course, Paul is telling us not to ignore sin and to just play around with sin and not to care about it. But then at the same time, he also tells us not to become so puffed up to think that we're so perfect that we will never sin again after we get saved. So there's a balance between the two. So let's see what Paul tells us in this passage. So beginning in verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. So Paul is saying that even though he's been saved, he's still in the flesh. And you know what that means if you're in the flesh? Because, you know, Scripture says that when we're saved, when we believe in Christ, when we're born again, God does a work of bringing new life to our spirit, to our soul. That's why we want to obey God and to love God and to serve God because we've been given a new spiritual life inside. But the thing is, we're still actually in the flesh. So the flesh doesn't do us any good because the flesh just drives us to want to sin all the time. Now, when we were an unbeliever, before we became a Christian, our we, we were in the flesh, but then our spirit was spiritually dead, which is really not a good combination. So if your spirit is dead and you are in the flesh, that means you're going to be given over to so much sinful ways. But the good news about a Christian is that inside our spirit, we've been born again. And that's the spirit is the thing that's going to go into heaven when we die. So, of course, when that happens, we're going to be sinless. We're going to be perfect for all eternity. But our spirit is trapped in our body, which is so weak. And when I mean weak, I don't mean weak as in like we're going to get old and we're going to get diseases and sicknesses and eventually we're going to end up in the grave. Our flesh is weak because... It constantly wants to give in to sin, like lust, pride, covetousness, jealousy, envying, bitterness, uh, selfishness. All these things are of the flesh. So even though the spirit wants to go in this direction, the flesh is wanting to go in that direction. And Paul was saying it was the same thing with him because there's a lot of good things that he wanted to do. But then he doesn't end up doing it sometimes because... He falls into sin because of his flesh. Now, I don't exactly know how the two exactly work, but it's telling us, Paul is saying that I want to do these great things, but then I end up sinning and not doing what I ought to. So basically, Paul is saying, I want to be perfect. I want to be sinless. I want to be just like Jesus, but I always fall short all the time. Why is that? Because I'm still in my fallen, sinful flesh. That's the reason why. Don't you guys think it's amazing that even Paul is admitting this? I mean, because sometimes, you know, we think, oh, you know, we sin so much and is God ever going to forgive me? And am I really a Christian if I sin this much? Well, Paul is saying you're in good company because if you fall into sin, I fall into sin too because all of us were still in our sinful flesh. That's why we struggle with sin. Now, Paul continues and says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. You see, the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that a non-Christian, an unbeliever, is not really going to struggle with sin. He's just going to go for it. Because, of course, he's in the flesh, but then his, his spirit is not born again. He's dead spiritually, which means that he's going to serve sin. He's a slave to sin. That's what Paul was saying when we're in like bondage to sin. That's what a life of an unbeliever is like, which means that 
he's not really going to want to do what's right. It's only pleasurable to do what is wrong, what is evil. See, that is what an unbeliever is like. But a Christian has been born again. He's been given new desires. So even though he falls into sin, he struggles with it. He wants to overcome sin. He doesn't want to sin. He wants to do better. He wants to go in the direction of godliness and righteousness and everything that the Lord is telling us to do. That's the difference between the attitude of the two people. So think about it yourself, guys. Which of the two are you in this category? Because if you are the Christian that says, Oh, I fall into sin, but I grieve so much. I'm so ashamed of it, and I want to do better. And I, you know, I don't want to continue to practice the things that I used to do before. See, if that's your attitude, like you just want to do better, and you grieve over sin because you love God's ways so much better, then you are indeed a true believer, just like Paul right here. That's normal for a Christian. That's how you can know that your faith is real. But then if you're on the other group, and you say, oh, I sin, but I really don't care. You know, it's, it doesn't really concern me. I don't really have much struggles. And, um, you know, I don't really want to do the things of God. You know, when I sin, it's more of like a conscience type of thing. But I really don't care whether it offends God or not. And I'm just going to continue on in that lifestyle. If you're in that category, then you're not a Christian. You've never repented. You don't have true faith. You've never been born again. Because if you've been born again, you wouldn't have that type of attitude. You would actually be in this category with those who love God's law, to those who love to do what is right. And that is exactly what Paul is saying right here. So basically in verse 21, he says this, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. This is exactly what I've been explaining to you all, is that Paul, inside of him, his spirit is alive. It's been made new. His spirit wants to do everything that pleases God. But then the only reason he cannot do it is that he's still in his fallen human flesh. Because the flesh just drags you in another direction. You see, I'm going to give you analogies. Just pretend this is like a stream, like a pond. You know, the water goes this way. So as a, as a uh, non-believer, as a non-Christian, you're going to go this way. So both your body and your spirit is going to just go this way. You're going to be going with the flow. But then when you are a Christian, you know what happens? Your spirit wants to go this way, but your flesh is like the stream that still wants to go this way. So what you're doing is you're fighting against the tide. You're actually wanting to go in this direction, even though the flesh is kind of pushing you and shoving you in this direction. You're actually going against the flow and you're not going with the flow. That's what a Christian is like. So that's how you can know you are a Christian. Now, you know, people ask me this sometimes. They say, oh, but how can I tell the difference? Because Christians sin and non-Christians also sin. So how, how, how do I know if my faith is real or not? Like if I sin this many times or I fall into this type of sin, does that mean I'm not really a believer to begin with? I'm so worried. I don't know what to do. This is where we need to clarify some things because, you know, it's not about how many sins you've committed that will determine whether you your faith is really real or not. It's more about the direction of your life because I, you have to see where exactly is your heart at. What is your motive? Because it's not about the perfection of your life. It's about the direction of your life. That's how you can tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Because both of them will sin, but what makes them different is that one has a direction and the other doesn't have a direction. Which means that one of them will be going in the direction of sin, just going along with the flow, but the other one will be going in the direction of God. Will be wanting to follow God and to obey God. 
That's how you can tell the difference between the two groups. And obviously, Paul is saying the same thing. That I am going in the direction of godliness, but the only reason why I stumble from time to time and do all this bad stuff that I don't like is that I'm still in my, you know, my sinful body. Now, the good news is that one day at the rapture of the church, all these bodies are going to be made new. This is called a glorified body. So then afterwards, we're not ever going to sin again. In heaven, we're going to be perfect. We're not going to be in shame. We're not going to mourn over our sin anymore because we're going to be perfect at that time. That's why we need God's grace. See, that's why Paul says here, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? So Paul was saying here that he sees that he can never match up to God's law. That in his fallen condition, he can never be perfect in this life. So that is why he needs God's grace. And that is why he says in verse 25, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. We need God's grace, not just for salvation, but also even for Christian living. Because the moment we don't live by grace anymore, we're going to always stumble into sin. We're going to lose our faith. So the Holy Spirit, what he does in our life is not only does he call us into the faith and he saves us by justifying us, but he also preserves our faith too. I mean, of course, God tells us in the Bible that we need to grow as a Christian. We need to, you know, obey. But then at the same time, the Holy Spirit is working in us so that we can get to the finish line. So our life is a journey. Until the day we go to heaven, it's a journey. But the Holy Spirit, he's the one who's going to carry us along so that we make it to the finish line. So I hope that brings some comfort to you guys, especially if you are a Christian. Because, you know, of course, in one sense, like I said, if you really are a Christian, you're going to mourn over your sin. You're going to hate it. You're going to be ashamed of it. You're going to wish that you can be perfect. But that is when God's grace is going to cover you. That's when God is going to say, it's okay. My grace is here. I've got your back. Continue to keep doing good. Continue to obey and to grow as a disciple of Jesus. But then, like I said, we also have to think about, is that really us? Because Paul is saying that a Christian struggles with sin. But then again, he takes comfort in God's grace because God's grace covers us until the day we go to be with him in heaven. But for some of us, we're deceived because some of us think, yeah, you know, we sin, Paul sinned as well, so I'm okay, I can continue to sin all I want. Remember, Paul also told us to examine our faith to see if it's real or not because people who sin and they don't care about it, they're not ashamed about it, they don't really think about honoring God with their life, even if they're in the church. These people, according to Paul, are probably most likely unregenerate. People who are not born again. These people have not been saved. See, I told you once again, you can tell the difference between the two groups because one of them has been changed inside. Even though he's still in the flesh, he's been changed inside. So you see the direction that they're moving towards godliness. But the other group has not been changed inside. And you can tell because they love their sin. They don't care about their sin. They don't feel any shame about their sin. They don't love God. They don't have any desire to serve him and obey him and glorify God. So I want you to think about which category you're in right now. Because if you're in this category of being a person who sins and doesn't really care much about it, then you need to be saved today. You can be if you repent of all your sins, you confess them before God, you mourn over it, you desire his righteousness, and then what God does is he's going to break the chains of sin from you so that you are now free in Christ. But if you are a Christian today, this is also a message for us today because of course, one message is telling us is that even if we fall into sin, 
God's grace is going to cover us. So don't be scared. Don't be worried that you lose your salvation, that you are covered in the blood of Christ. Also keep in mind, guys, that this passage is also warning us uh, against, you know, this idea of perfectionism, thinking that we can be perfect in this life, that we, we actually think we can be perfect because we cannot be. And the moment we think that we can be perfect is the moment when we're, we start to no longer confess our sin. We no longer feel we need the grace of God. So don't ever be in that category, guys, because we're never going to be perfect in this life. We can get kind of close, but we're not going to quite get there. Every step of the way in this life, we need God's grace to cover us and to protect us. So I pray that if you are here today and you are a child of God, you have given your life to Jesus and you are sold out for Jesus. You'll fall into sin, but you know what? Scripture tells us, just continue to move on. Continue to serve God, to grow in God, to confess your sin before God, and He'll be faithful to forgive you of your sin. So that's what the Christian journey is like. But don't worry, one day, guys, the good news is we'll get our glorified bodies and we will be sinless in that day. So until that day, you know, don't treat sin lightly, but at the same time, don't get stressed out thinking that sin is going to take away your salvation. Because if you have repented and trusted in Christ, God has got you all the way. Let's pray. Lord, we mourn over our sin. We are so horrified that we are still in this body, Lord because we still fall into sin. Temptation is so real to us. But in this situation, this is why we need the Holy Spirit, why we need to depend on you and why we need to exercise self-control and to discipline ourselves so that we don't sin, but rather that we continually do what is right. So Lord, give us that self-control. Help us to discipline ourselves so that we don't continually carelessly fall into sin, but that we might be testimonies of your transformation within us. That's what we pray for, Lord. So once again, we pray that you'll please forgive us of our sin, even the ones we committed today. If we committed sins today, it shows that we are just like Paul, that we want to do what's right, but we keep falling and we are just so imperfect. We come before you with a humble attitude, acknowledging our imperfection and wanting your grace. And we're so glad, Lord, that you forgive us of our sin and you will show us your grace. And one day, Lord, we will be perfect and we will see you face to face. But until that day, Lord, we pray for your grace to cover us and to protect us along the way. And all this we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, that's pretty much it for our Sunday service here at Nasung. And I want to remind you guys once again, uh, keep up with your Senna books and also keep up with being on time for our Friday night Bible studies at 7 p.m. And of course, join us again next week as we will continue to worship the Lord together as a church. So God bless you all, and I'll see you soon.